sets and counting. So our primary objective is counting. We do sets as a way to count things. We don't do sets theory as in topological theory or anything like that. The way we talk about sets is that we want to learn how to count things. So our objective really is to know how to count. So I'm going to have here three sets. A equal red, blue, and the number one. B is the number one, the number two, the color blue, and an object which is a square. And C is the object square, the number one, and the object round. So if I'm to uh, plot these things, uh, I get A, B, and C. And I have here red, blue, two, one, the square, and the round. You can see how blue and one are in both A and B. Blue and one, blue and one. One is in all three sets, one, one, one. Square is in C and B, and round is just in C. Now, I picked this example on purpose because a lot of the classical examples are either one, two, three, or red, blue, green. Sets can have anything in them. If I'm happy with sets that have various types of elements, that's okay. So what is the, again, this is a little recap for 15 minutes. What is the Cartesian product of these sets? This is all triplets with an element from A, an element from B, an element from C. So it's a set of all triplets. The element in this, this is a set. The elements in it are triplets. So what are those? Red, one, square. That is red from A, one from B, square from C. Red, one, one. Red, one, zero. Red, two, square. Red, two, one. Red, two. I guess this is round. It's not zero. What I mean is a round circle, but zero, I guess it's fine to understand. So that's six of them. What I done, I done red one square, red one one, red one round, red two square, red two one, red two round. So now um, I keep going with red. I'm still at red, but now I move to blue. Blue square, red blue one, red blue round, red square, square, red square, <coughs> one, red square, round. Now I'm finished with red because I've done all possibilities with red. So I move into the next one which is blue. Blue, one, square, blue, one, one, Blue, one, round. Blue, two, square. Blue, two, one. Blue, two, round. Blue, blue, square. Blue, blue, one. Blue, blue, round. Blue, square, square. Blue, square, one. Blue, square, round. I'm down blue now. This blue. Because I have everything that starts with blue. And finally, I move to the last element. One, one, square.
square <coughs> one 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 sorry one yes one 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 I said one 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 um, one one round one two square one two one one two round one blue square one blue one one blue round one square square one square one one square round is that all of them? <laughs> that's all of them so this is the set Cartesian product. So, Cartesian product. <coughs> now, the size of this set is always the size of A times the size of B times the size of C, which is, in my case, 3 times 4 times 3, that will be 36. Uh, and this you can think of it as all sequences of ABC. In all these sequences, this A always comes from the first set, B always comes from the second set, C always comes from the third set. Could be a little confusing if you see blue and blue. This blue is certainly coming from the first set, while this second blue, it's the second set. Always. Those sequences are always organized like that. And this is called the product rule. That's um, the number of combinations. Really, the name is sequence. <coughs> Combinations, it's, it's, a, it's a vague name, we call combinations everything. Really we should call it sequence. Uh, is how many things I can get from A times how many things I can get from B times how many things I can get from C. Because everybody from A goes with everybody from B goes with everybody from C. That is when I said I have three pants, four shirts and two hats. I get every pants with every shirt with every hat. That's a unique combination to this up. So, as an example here, there are three sections of CS1800. We'll call them Jay, Kevin, and Virgil by instructors. Uh, and this section has 450 students, this one has 60, and our section has 110 students. In how many ways can I get the triplet I want a student from J section, a student from Kevin section, and a student from Virgil section. I want to get all triplets of picking a student from each section. And how many ways can I do that? Number of triplets, <coughs> the size of this will be 450 times 60 <coughs> times one hundred and nine. So I can pick everyone from this section, with everyone from this section, with everyone from this section. So that's a way of counting. It's a particular way of counting, but that's a way of counting. If if we can say our possibilities, what we want to count, can be broken into something from here and something from there, and everybody <coughs> goes with everybody, every pant goes with every shirt. Then I have a way of counting because I take how many pants I have times how many shirts I have. What if I have 20 people and six cars and every person goes every car? Same way, the number of possibilities I get is 20 times six. What if I want three students, one from this section, this section, this section? Every triplet is possible, so I get the product. So every time we count things, we ask two questions. First, did I count everything? I mean, all possibilities. 
Whenever we count things, we have to be worried not to miss something that's valid. And the other question is, did I count any possibility more than once? Those are the fundamental questions of counting, and you have to ask them for every single technique. In the case of product rule, did I count every single possibility of every student from there, then from there, then from there? Yes. Did I count any possibility more than once when I do all these products? No. But those would be trickier once we get to different other counting problems. Okay, moving on, I'm going to pick one of these sets, B, which is uh, one, two, blue, and the square, <coughs> and I'm going to say, uh, which is the power set of B? The power set of B is the set of all subsets of B. Now, the only confusing part here is that this is a, the elements here. So if B is an element in the power set of B, that's an element in a set, then that's the same as saying B is a subset of B. So this B is a subset. So the only thing that you have to sleep on is how come in, a, in this new set, power set, the elements are actual sets. But once you get over that, things will be easy. So what is the power set of B? What are all the possible subsets? <coughs> well, the empty set is always there. Then I get subsets. This is zero element. I get subsets with one element. One, two, blue, and square. Those are uh, the subsets with one element. This is one element. Then I get subsets with two elements, like one two or one blue, one square, two blue, two square, and blue square. Those are two element sets. I get also subsets with three elements, like one, two, and blue. One, two, and square. There's supposed to be a comma between those things. One, blue, square and two blue square. So those are subsets of three elements. And there's one subset that has all elements, all four, one, two, blue, and square. So this is the power set. And the size of the power set is 2 to the size of the set, that is in our case 2 to the 4, that's 16. That's true for all sets when we do the power set. The reason for that is that if you look at my set, 1, 2, it's a little bit. 1, 2, 3, 4, and square, there is two possibilities here. There's two possibilities here, two possibilities here, and two possibilities here. Those are independent possibilities. They don't depend on each other. And I'm back to this problem of two pants, two shirts, two hats, and two ties. Any pant goes with any shirt, with any tie, with any hat. So I can choose any of these. What are the possibilities, by the way, in here? Why do I say the two possibilities? What are those? 
either in the set or it's not. Either in the set or not in the set. What are the two possibilities for element two? In the set or not. For blue, could be in the set or not. For square, could be in the set or not. So the two possibilities, either in the set, subset, because we're looking at subset, or not in the subset. Those are the two possibilities. And 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 will be 2 at how many elements I have in the original set. Okay? So the way we count how many subsets are here, we're using effectively this rule right here. Then we were doing, say, um, with these sets, what if I want, I'm still at those three sets, what if I want the union, A union B union C? So of course I can look at those sets and figure out what the union is. What is the union of those sets? It's one, two, blue, uh, what do I have there? One, again, red, I guess red. One, two, blue red, square, uh, and then I'm, I need a circle, right? And how do I compute the size of the union? I say that's the size of the three sets minus the size of the intersections. The idea being here Everything in the intersection has been counted twice, so I take it out once. Right? But now, what's in the common intersection, this one, has been counted three times for three sets, but has been taken out three times for three intersections. This one is on every pair intersection, so I have to put the intersection back in of all three. And we've called this inclusion exclusion principle now this is a different way of counting things counting the union it's not a product group it's a different mechanism so counting the union is a new thing how many people follow me so far hands up great there is a particular case of this, these joint sets. Yes. What does these joint sets mean? What does it mean, this joint? Somebody else, this joint. <laughs> what? No, now intersection on any two. So it's not like no intersection, all of them. I don't mean that. I mean any two of them do not intersect at all. A with B, A with C, B with C, C with D, not two of them intersect. Well, if there is no intersection, what happens with all these A intersect B, A intersect C, B intersect C, A intersect B and C, all, all of the intersections in this, in this formula, what happens to those if every intersection is void? what will be the size of those all those intersections? Zero. Zero. So then this rule becomes the union is simply just add them up. If there's no intersection, take the union, you just add up how many elements there are. And if I have four sets, A union, B union, C, again, this is the disjoint case only works for this joint set. If I have four sets, that would be A plus B plus C plus D. Now, those in here are not these joint sets. Clearly, they have intersections between them. Blue is in those two, the square is in those two, one is in all three. Those are not this joint. This joint means there are no intersections of any two sets. So in my case, A, B, C, D here, I draw four sets. Where, if the sets are disjoint, where are the elements allowed to be? What part is, is allowed to be here? 
right? This is good, <coughs> this area, because that's only this set. This area is also good, because this area is <coughs> only that set. This area is also good, because it's that set. And this area is the set. Everything in between them is some intersections of two or three or all four sets. That's not allowed if they are disjoint. They have to be elements only in these areas here. And I think the rule is pretty easy to see, th this rule. If there are disjoints, to take the whole union, it's whatever here plus whatever here plus whatever here plus whatever here. The way we can see that is by applying the two counting questions. If I say in the union, this is the correct count, A plus B plus C plus D, did I count everything? Did I miss anything in my union? No, because anything in the union must come from one of the sets. So I count everything. Did I count anything twice in the union? If I do this, why not? Why is not anything counted twice now? Yes? Because all elements are only in one of the sets. Nothing has been counted twice. Twice would be in the intersection. But there is no intersection. Always when you count things, ask yourselves those two questions. Did I count everything? First question. Did I count everything or anything more than once? Because then if you do, you have to take it out. Now, this has a name. What was the name of this? Sum rule, right? Sum rule, product rule. The sum rule is simply a particular case of inclusion exclusion where there is no intersection. Now, I don't like the name sum rule. That's the way we use it, that's the way the whole world is using it. But I think, it, it, the people, you know, they, because of pluses, plus, 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 bam, sum rule. You know what name I really like? <laughs> Partition rule. Let me tell you why. What, what does it mean, partition? What partition mean? The English word partition. Somebody else. When do you use the word partition? What? Like organizing my closet. Partition. What does it mean? I decided to put my pants on one side, my shirts on the center, and my hats on the other side, right? That's a partition of the closet. How many people do that? They partition their closets. Whoever doesn't, they have a mess in the closet, right? It's everything, boom, <laughs> like that. Guys usually don't have a nice partition of their closets. Only get partitioned closets when they marry. What, what else partition do we do? People use a garage. They put the tools, organize the tools. Usually they have a partition in mind. Let me put those tools in here, those tools in there, right? We use partitions all the time. When we partition our time, we think of it as sleeping time, eating time, school time, entertaining time, for example, right? When, when CNN organize their articles, they have a partition in mind. That's politics, that's business. That, the, all those things are partitions. What's so special about partitions? Yes. No intersections. No intersection. When we say partition in math, but also in common sense life, we mean we separate things. There's nothing in between, right? If I say I take all 110 students here and I want to make three partitions or some exercise of recitation, what do I mean? I want to group people in three sets with no intersection. When we use the word partition, it means no intersection. So that's to say that partition actually implies the condition. When you say sum, if I just tell you before sets a week ago, sum rule, you'll be like, OK, you're going to add something, right? The only thing that leads you to sum is to say, OK, there's a bunch of pluses because it's got to be an addition. That's why you call it sum rule. I think partition is much more meaningful. Partition is saying whatever you're doing, you're going to separate things. And that's very important in counting. When we count things, we're going to use a lot the notion of partition. We want to see how many people have diabetes in the world. What do we do the first thing? 
the organization, the health organization wants to count the, the diabetes, they're going to do a partition. They're going to say, I'm going to count the diabetes in North America, then I'm going to count the diabetes in South America, then I'm going to count the diabetes in Europe, then I'm going to count diabetes in Africa, and then in Asia. That thinking is a partition counting, right? I want to count something, in this case, number of diabetes, uh, people with diabetes. And how do I think of that counting? I take the whole space that I want to count and I partition into chunks. And then what do I have to do? Because it's a partition, there's no intersection, right? There's no intersection between North America and Europe. So then how do I count the diabetes? I use this rule, I say count of all diabetes is the ones in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, and Asia, and I add them up together. And I can do that because partition ensures no intersection. That is, nothing will be counted twice. In many problems, it's very useful to first do a partition when you count things. To say, I have to count all passwords that have the following properties. Fine. Then I split those passwords into two kinds. The passwords that start with A, and the passwords that do not start with A. Is that a partition? You want to do definitely a partition in the beginning. When you count a problem, when you split, I want to do, you know, separately count that set and that set. You want to make sure that's a partition of the whole space. We want to count how many students have difficulties in the first year. We're going to partition them into those kind of students, those kind of students, those kind of students. If that's a partition, then we count each set and then we add up the numbers. Partition is a fundamental principle of counting. It's really this rule, no intersections means the union, add up the parts. But that's why I like the name better. So counting with partition means split the, the space or the set into these joint parts or sets and then count each part separately add the count. Many counting problems, that's going to be our base idea. Split into parts, count each side, make sure it's a partition, make sure nothing is intersection, but it covers the whole set. A partition cannot miss elements. And then count each part separately. In computer science, we call this idea divide and conquer. That applies to solving problems. Take a big problem, breaking into sub-problems, solve each sub-problems, and then put back the result together. Okay? Um, so then, we have the sum rule. <coughs> Let's uh, do some examples here. Simple counting examples. Uh, this is simple counting. I have passwords of four characters characters can be capital letters A to Z could be small letters A to Z or the digit 0 to 9 those are the uh, characters that are allowed there's no commas no hyphens no dashes nothing and this is my password right
uh, I have no restrictions. How many? This, this question, how many, will be so, so all, everywhere for us in this module. Sometimes we don't even say it. Every time I say you have passwords, this and that, it means count the passwords. Uh, you have people, this and that, count the people. So that's what we do, the whole module. We count things. Okay? So how many <laughs> possibilities are here? If there are no restrictions. <laughs> Right, so she's saying there's 62 possibilities here because there's 26 capital letters, 26 more letters, and 10 digits. So total, how many possibilities are there? 62, right? 62, 62 possibilities, 62, 62 possibilities. So if there's no restriction, means every character goes with every character, goes with every character, with every character, what rule do we apply here? So we get what? 62 times 62 times 62 times 62 is 62 to the fourth. In this chapter, you are not expected to compute these values. Okay, so when I say compute the number of things, you can leave it at 62 to the four. I'm not asking for the one. Uh, Four seven seven six three three six. That, that's what this number is. I, I don't care about that at all. Don't, don't bother. Get to sixty-two to the four, or sixty-two to the four times seventeen to the five, or something like that. We don't need to do the final calculation unless the problem specifically <coughs> asks it. Produce the decimal number. That's the count. Okay, the problem has that fine, but in the counting problems, we stop here. Sixty-two to the four. Um, what if, another one, I have passwords <coughs> uh, 6 to 10 characters, um, they, the same set allowed, A to the Z, a to the Z and 0 to 9, so 62 possibilities. But there's a condition, at least one letter and at least one digit. So not all possibilities are allowed here. Every password to be valid has to contain at least one letter and one digit. So for example, uh, <coughs> something that is seven characters, or uh, A, B, Z, C, P, R, A again, it's not allowed. Although it has the, the correct length, the length has to be between six and 10. This is no good because it has no digit. Invalid because no digits. So how do I count this? How many passwords have length 6 to 10 and have at least one letter and at least one digit? Can you start by, um, like for now just looking at the six character long ones and saying um, the total possibility or like the union of all would be 62 to the sixth half. So he's saying, take first only the sixth one, right? So don't worry, so to speak, about the other ones. Is that what you mean? Just consider the sixth one. What effectively he just did? Partition. A partition. He, he immediately thought, hey, the way to count six to 10 passwords, characters, <laughs> is to do the six ones first, then the seventh one then the eight one, ninth one, and ten one, right? So they immediately, he thought, okay, that's a six character, there's a seven character uh, set, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's an eight character set. There is a nine character, and so on and so forth, right? 
Is this a partition? Does it include all valid passwords? Am I counting everything by saying 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10? Am I missing some password that's valid for me? No. Is anything in the intersections of those things? Because remember, to be a partition, the intersection has to be void. Is any valid password having seven characters and in the same time eight characters? No. So this is a valid partition, which means I still have to figure out how many passwords are here, how many here, how many here, how many here. But once I do that, what do I do with those counts? Add them up. Make sense? So the first thing he just said is to create a partition of the space I'm counting, of those possibilities. And if that's a partition, then the count's going to be simply the sum of the counts. Now, this may seem trivial in some cases, like in here. If somebody says that, you immediately, you don't even think of a partition. You think, that, that sounds reasonable to me. <coughs> but please ask yourself this question when you start with a partition, which is often the right thing to do. Think of the space breaking up into chunks. Did I include everything? Because everything has to be in some chunk. And then, am I having any intersection? Am I somehow, the passwords that I'm splitting in here to here, have some intersection, which means something will be counted twice. In this case, it's obvious this is a partition of the space. And then keep going. What do you say? For six characters, we do what? Um, so you can start with all possible combinations? All, which you already know how many they are, because we, we just did it in here. Those will be how many? 62 to the sixth power. Right. Because all means every possibility. That is what rule. That's the product rule, right? 62 possibilities times 62, 62, 62, 62. There'll be all passed for 62. But not, now some of them are invalid. <laughs> so we have to take what? Um, so first, if it doesn't include at least one digit, then it would be 52 to the sixth power. But let us write in English, all minus what? <coughs> what do you want to take out? Not how many, but what? Those with no numbers. Only? Letters. Only letters, and then? Um, then subtract only numbers. Only digits. So this is the set of all passwords, <coughs> minus the only letters, minus the only digits. <coughs> I think he just did another partition of the space now. What's the partition here? The effective partition. How did, how, why this came out that way? Uh, the set of all passwords is all passwords to six characters. It's got split into only letters. Those will be A, B, Z, A, C, F. And only digits. Those would be what? <coughs> one, two, zero, one, two, five. And the other set that is part of the partition is what? The ones that are exactly the ones I want. The remaining ones, I did already all the ones with letters. This is all the ones with numbers. So what are the rest in this set? The ones that have at least one letter and at least one digit, right? So effectively what happened here we looked at set of all passwords with six digits, and we split that space into three. We ask ourselves, what are the possibilities? One possibility is only digits. One possibility is only letters. And the third possibility is letters and digits. At least one letter, at least one digit. Again, we ask ourselves, is this a correct partition of the space of all passwords of six characters? What do we need to say? Did we include every password? Is every password either only digits or only letters or at least one and one? Is that true or not? And then is any password common to these sets? Is any one of those three sets when you intersect them gives you a password that somehow fit in both sets? That's what makes it a partition. How many people with me? When you make a partition, you should be clear that's a partition. I don't say you have to write it down, but that would be nice for whoever reads what you write. This is a partition of that space. And be clear what are the partitions. Only letters, only digits, 
and something that's not only letters or only digits. Now with this partition, what we're going to apply again, since it's a partition, we apply the partition rule or the sum rule. And we say the, the sum of those three sets is all the passwords with six characters. But we don't want all, I mean we have all, we want this size. Right? So if we call this x, y, actually let's call it letters, digits, and mix. Okay? Three sets. In here we're going to have the sets of all, the size of this set is the size of only letters plus the size of only digits plus the size of the mixed ones. That's what the sum rule is saying. The union is the size, sum of the sizes, if there's no intersection, if it's a partition. Now, of course, we know all that 62 to the 6. How about this? We know this. What is this? Only letters. Somebody else. Yes. Because there's 52 letters, and all possibilities are allowed. So when we do this calculation, we're going to get what? 62 to the 6, that's all. Minus how many have only letters? 52 to the 6. And how many have only digits? <coughs> all sequences of digits are allowed. 10 to the 6. <coughs> how about in the case of 8 characters? If I do the same reasoning, I split this into all passwords of 8 characters versus the ones that have only letters versus the ones that have only digits. And my plan is to get the mixed ones. What's the size of mixed ones in here? What's the size of all passwords with eight characters? I mean, it's the same like here, just not six, it's eight instead. 62 to the eight minus. 62 to the eight minus. Now, of course, I get how many counts? Six, that was the initial partition. Password to six characters, seven characters, eight, nine, and ten. Every one of these gives me a count. I have to sum up those counts. Right? In these questions, we now don't care about the actual. So the final answer would be something like 62 to the 6 minus 52 to the 6 minus 10 to the 6. That's a group of 6. Then 62 to the 7 minus 52 to the 7 minus 10 to the 7 plus all the way to the last one. Which is uh, 62 <coughs> to the 10, is the last one 10, 52 to the 10, 10 to the 10. This is the answer we're looking for. So you don't have in this problem to compute this any further. Unless the problem specifically asks for it. If it says, okay, I need the actual decimal number then you need a calculator to do these computations. But when we count, this will be uh, a reasonable answer. Okay? So that is what we do with counts. This is simple counting problems that relies on everything we said so far, either uh, sound rule or partition rule. I like the name partition because clearly state what you are doing. You are taking the space, breaking into chunks count each chunk separately. Now, if we can't do a proper partition, if, what happens if we try to do a partition, but the sets, no matter what we try, they have intersections? Can we apply the sum rule? No. But what can we apply if there are some intersections? There's a general rule that works for any sets. So in some cases, we're not going to be able to make a partition. There will be some intersections because we can't avoid them. We don't know how to define those sets properly partitioned. That's still OK, except now we have to count the intersections. It's easy to make a partition, if you can, so that all the intersections are 0, and you sum up just the chunks of the partition. But if there are intersections, we're going to have to take them out, add them back in, so on and so forth. So it still works, but you have to count the intersections, which can be a tricky problem. Now, moving on.
I want to show you another way of counting. So this is a counting with one to one functions. One to one is the name in here United States. In other parts of the world, it's called bijection. You see a bijection function, that's mean a one to one. In other parts of the world, it's called pairing. So what is one of those functions? We have two sets, A to B, right? a function, let's say H. This function is a bijection, or one to one, same thing, just different names, or pairing. If, if you look at those sets, A and B, everybody from A goes to somewhere in B, but it goes backwards too. So every element in A goes uniquely to an element in B. So if H of A equal B pairs AB for every pair, for every A, B, A, B. This is how bijection looks like. Pairs, things. So it has two properties. One property is called injection. <coughs> if you pick two different A's, their mapping has to be different. So what the injection property is saying, if you take two different things and you move them into the set B, you have to end up with different things. You can't move two things into the same value. Some functions do that, right? Some functions take two elements and map it to the same values. Think of the function age. Function A, age, takes a person and maps it into an integer, right? Positive integer, which is the age. Is that an injection function, age? Are there any two people who get the same age? Of course. It's not an injection. To be an injection, you need to have this property that every two goes to separate two. And the other property is surjection, which is Every B in the destination set is a destination. Every. In other words, there is an A such that H of A equals B. See, some functions, like the H function, leave some integers not covered at all. Think about the H function, and this is the number 300. Is any person that has the age 300? No. You follow me? There are some functions that do not give you all the possible values in the destination set. Those are not bijections. To be a bijection, you need to have these two properties. Everyone in here has to pair with someone here, and everyone in here has to be paired with someone there. Right? So I cannot have what is not allowed is to have, in the injection case, this is not allowed. That means two things go to one that's not allowed. In the subjection case, what's not allowed is to have things going there, right? But there is some element here that's the destination of no one. So those are the properties of one-to-one -one functions. <laughs> now, here's the theorem. If h from a to b is a one-to-one -one function, or bijection, then the size of a is the same as the size of b. That's common sense. That's a need of proof. If there is a pairing from a to b, whatever many elements are in a, 
have to be the same number in B, right? Because the pairing says for every element in A, there's one in B, and for every one in B, there's one in A. That means we have to have <coughs> the same number of elements. What if I tell you I can make a pair between every boy in this classroom and every girl in this classroom? What can you conclude? Number of boys is the same as number of girls, right? What if I tell you I can map every person to a house? Uniquely, two people do not go to the same house and every house should spare with a person. What can you conclude? Number of people is the same as the number of houses, okay? That's a very powerful mechanism for counting things. Let me give you an example. How about if my set A is the set 1, 2, 3, up to 10, and my set B is all the natural numbers with the property 2 is smaller than x, smaller than 72, and 7 divides x. Remember we had this thing at recitations with a range that was given and is divisible by something. Right? I tell you a very safe way to do this is indexing. Formally, indexing means a bijection. A bijection will map the indexes uniquely to those values. So when I said indexing and I show you how to break the multiples of seven in this case into indexes, what I did, in fact, but didn't state it that way, is to create this bijection. So is there a bijection that will take any x in there and will map it there? Yes. Seven times one. Seven times x. Oh. Takes any element from here. <coughs> is that true? Seven times x takes element from here, moves it here? The first multiples of seven in this set is? Seven. Seven, which is seven times one. The last multiple of 7 in here is 70, 70 which is 7 times 10. This is a bijection. Why is it a bijection? It is injective. If x is different y, then 7x would be different than 7y. Right? It cannot map two elements into the same value. And it is a subjection. Subjective because everybody in B is a destination. Everybody in here is the result of some H, right? Every multiple of seven, it's seven times something. So what do I conclude? The size of B must be what? Same as size of A, but A is very easy to, to count. That's what I showed you yesterday or the other day at recitation. Once I have the indexes, those are the indexes. Indexes are very easy to count. From 1 to 10, I know the size. So 10 must have the same size, this set. If I create such a bijection, I know the size of the other set because one of the sets is easy to count. How about another example? I want to count Z7 times Z11. This is a Cartesian product. So this is a reminder mode 7 with 1 and 11. And of course I can do 7 times 11. That gives me the, 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 the Cartesian product. But I could also try a bijection. I could have an H. That is the Chinese reminder theorem that we didn't do a bijection. Uh, I can take any element in Z77 and move it into Z7 times Z11 by what's the bijection, the Chinese reminder bijection? It takes every reminder here and it maps it into X mod 7 and X mod 11. 
the Chinese reminder theorem was stating that this function is a bijection. For every reminder in Z77, for example, 55, you get a unique pair of reminders, Z modulo 7 and modulo 11. If this is a bijection, meaning everybody goes to a different pair and every pair is covered, that means the sizes, this is a bijection, it's actually the Chinese reminder theorem bijection then the size of Z77 is the size of Z7 times Z11. <coughs> Another example. I have a set A which is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z. So that's the size of A is what? 26, right? And I want to count all subsets of A that include elements so there are many subsets in there, right? It's the whole power set. How big is the power set of this of this set? If I do all the subsets, how many are there? Yeah. Two to the twenty-six. I want to count not all of them, but only the ones that contain the letter A. Now there are small sets that contain A, like for example A B C, and there are big sets that contain A, A Z D U V so on and so forth. And there's also small sets that do not contain A and small sets that do not, that big sets that do not contain A. So how do I count all the subsets that contain letter A? I can do it in two ways. One way is to do it the way we think of the power set, right? It was A, B, C, D. How did we count the power set? We say every one element has two possibilities, in the set or not in the set. Right? That gives me all subsets. But now for A, there's only one possibility. Right? Because I'm forcing A to be in the set. So there's only one possibility here, which is in the subset. How many possibilities I have for B? Two, two, two. So what is going to be the number of possibilities that I have here if I, if I only restrict A to B in the set? So there's not two possibilities anymore. It's just one. But everybody else still has two possibilities. Two to the size of A minus one, right? Because I still have two, 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 just like before, except one is not in two possibilities. It's only one possibility. But I can also do the bijection. I can answer this question by bijection. So here's the bijections I want. Uh, here's the, the, the sets, all the sets that contain A. And here's all the sub subsets subsets that do not contain A. Is this a partition of the power set? Say every subset must either contain A or not contain A. There is no other possibility. And it's a partition because any subset cannot be in both places. If it contains A, it cannot be here. And if it doesn't contain A, it cannot be here. Those would be the sets like that, that contain A. And those would be the subsets without A, something like uh, B, C, D. Right? Can I construct a bijection between those two? Take any element that contain A, do something to obtain a unique set that does not contain A. Is there a function that does that? Takes a set that's guaranteed to have A in it, does something to the set to obtain a set uniquely. This has to be a pairing function that does not contain A in it. 
Anybody know such a function? Somebody else. Is there a function that gives me a set, I get a set V that I know for sure contains A. I want to move now into a set U such that A does not belong to you. So I take a set V that I know for sure contains A because all the sets in here contain this element A. And I want to transform it into a set that does not contain A uniquely. So I have to have a one-to-one -one pairing. Yes? It would have all the elements except for the first one? Except for A. So the function should be what? U is, so uh, this is the function I'm looking for. Who is this U? Is the element V, the set V, taking out A. So my, my H, my function H of V will be take V, take element A out of it, and I get a set without A. <coughs> now, is this a bijection? Can I take two different sets in here? both containing A. Remove A from both of them and end up to the same set. So we have to verify those two properties. Injection, subjection. What injection means? If I take two sets that contain A, for each one of them I remove the A and I get two U's, right? Can those two U's be the same U? Who's following me here? Hands up so I can see them. Don't be shy. All right. So what am I doing here? I'm constructing a function that works on sets. I take a set that contain A, and I end up with a set that does not contain A, because my function removes A from the set. Now I want to verify those two properties. The injection says, if you pick two Vs that both contain A, two subsets, for example, <laughs> A, B, C, and A, Z, T, U, V. Those are two subsets that both contain A. If I remove A from both sets, the results, can the results be the same? Yes? So probably not, as long as we assume that there were no duplicates among the original set. Sets don't have duplicates or yeah. subsets, right. So the point is, if those two sets were different, but they were both containing A, their difference must come from other elements, not from A. So when I remove A, they still have a difference in those other elements. So then I get different results. The second property, the subjection, is it true that this procedure can generate any set that doesn't have A? If somebody picks an, a subset, for example, B, C, D, B, C, and D, is there a set here that when I remove A, I get B, C, D? Is there some set V that when I remove A, I get B, C, D? Yeah, is this set plus A in it? So because it's an injection and surjection, it's a bijection, which means what? What does a bijection mean? The sides of those two sets are the same. So if I call this is set S and this is set T, that means the size of S is the size of T. If H is bijection, or one to one, that means the size of S is the size of T. But this is a partition of the space. So the size of S plus the size of T is the size of the whole P of A, which I know how much it is. It's two at the A. So if I tell you I have two numbers that are the same, and their sum is two to the A, how much is each one of them? Yes? Half. Half. So that means the size of S has to be 2 at A minus 1, and the size of T has to be 2 at A minus 1. What did I do? I created a partition, and I showed the bijection that the two, two partition sides are the same size, because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. But I know the total size, so each one of them has to be half.
I want to count all numbers uh, made of digits, this particular sequence of digits, 1, 1, 1, 8, 9. So in any order. So the, the possibilities to get a number is 1, 1, 1, 8, 9, 1, 1, 1, uh, 1, 1, 8, 1, 9, 1, 1, 8, 9, 1, 8, 1, 8, 1, 9, 1, etc. Right? I can make any arrangements of these digits. But there's only one way to do 1, 1, 1 here. So how many possibilities do I have? How many numbers can I create with the five digits, one, 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 eight, and nine? <coughs> That's the problem. And I'm going to apply this principle with the function, one-to-one -one functions. I'm going to say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take every one of these numbers that I can create, and I have a function h, which takes that number, and gives the positions of 8 and 9 in it. So my function will, will return a position, will return something like uh, 45, because the position of 8 is the fourth position, and the position of 9 is the, ninth, is the fifth position. Again, this function returns the positions. So let's do this thing, 1, 1, um, 1, 1, 8, 1, 1, 1, 8, 9 will be 45. How about this? 1, 1, 1, 8, 1, 9, 1. This will be what? 24. How about 9, 1, 1, 1, 8? The positions are in order. 51 because 81119 is 13. How many people follow this? I'm taking that number and I'm only writing down the position of 8, then the position of 9. In that order, exact. How about 11819? Maybe we did this one already. This is what? 35, right? 3 and 5. Is this a one-to-one -one correspondence? <coughs> Is it any number here uniquely correspond to a two digits? Can I get two numbers and get the same exact value on this side? No. That's verifying the injection property. You take two sequences, you always get two different values. Now, is it covering this set? Well, I have to define this set. What, are the, what is exactly this set? What are the possible values here in this set? Because I, I kind of constructed the function, but now I have to define exactly what the set B is. Yes? Where the first digit is from 1 to 5, and the second digit is also from 1 to 5. Yeah, but 2, 2 is allowed. Oh, sorry, no, no. We're uh, excluding. So I get numbers times. with two digits, right, from 1 to 5, but two different digits. Right? Like 2-2 two, two is not an option. 3-3 three, three is not an option. How many numbers are from 1 to 5 with different digits? How can we com compute that? Numbers from 1 to 5. Uh, two, numbers of two digits. Both digits are from 1 to 5, but they cannot be the same. Can't we apply some rules like we did here? Somebody else. Yes. Well, if you have five options for the first number and then you take one away because the next one can't be the same, so uh -huh. it'd be five times four. Right. So if what she's saying is how many options I have for the first one, that's five options because it's five digits. But the second one doesn't have five options <laughs> because the digit that you put here is not allowed anymore, right? If you put here a three, you can't put the three. So how many options I have for here? Four. Four. 
So four, five possibilities, four possibilities, that implies 20 ohms. So that way, I managed to count how many sequences are in here. Because this one-to-one -one mapping tells me there's the same set sizes. If you can count this set, then you can count this other set. This is a super powerful technique that the regular section doesn't do. One-to-one -one counting, it's transforming the problem you have into a different problem that it's easier to count, like in here. We still have the same count, it's just maybe easier to think about it than in with this count. Okay, uh, the, I have another example here. So play, suppose I play an elimination tournament of any kind, whether it's soccer or bridge or uh, I don't know, any game. And it's a tournament. In tournaments, the organizers of the tournament decide who plays with who. There is an algorithm. If you play with this team and you win, you're going to play the winner from that other game. Now, how do, how this design goes, if you look at tennis tournaments or World Cup tournaments, there is a arrangement in brackets. These two plays and then the winner plays of those two. Like in NBA playoffs, you can see the brackets from the very beginning, right? The same thing with the World Cup tournaments. And you can arrange this in different ways. You can decide the winner of this game plays that winner or that winner or that winner. In elimination tournament, Every game has a winner and a loser, and the loser immediately loses the competition, goes home. What I would like to, to show is that no matter how you design the tournament, the number of games, I can compute the number of games that need to be played. You can, it's up to you to design a tournament, but I can compute exactly how many games you need to end up with a final winner. I'm going to do that with a one-to-one -one function. I map every game to what? A winner. A loser. Every game has a unique loser. Is that the one-to-one -one mapping? Is every game having a unique loser? Yeah. Is any loser corresponding uniquely to a game? Oh, God. Right? Can I do it with a winner, like he said? Can I map every game with a winner? With multiple games, can have the same winner now? Yeah. But every game has an exact loser. So how many losers are in a tournament if I have 100 teams? To get, that, to get up and up with one, one winner at the end, I have to have 99 losers, right? So how many games the tournament will have, guaranteed? 99 games, no matter how you design it. Counting with one-to-one -one function, very powerful tool, if you know how to use it. So what we're going to do now is to do fancy counting. That's the basic stuff. So how do we count more things? Things that are really complicated. <laughs> we need two notions that we haven't done yet. And maybe some of you have seen them. Some of you did not see them. One is the notion of permutation. Permutation of a sequence or of a set means the same thing. The reason it means the same thing, a sequence is in order A, B, C, D. A set is out of order A, B, C, D. But the reason permutation means the same is because permutations refers to all possible orders. Whether I start with a set or a sequence, all possible ways to arrange these four symbols will be the same. Right, so that means uh, particular <coughs> order of A, B, C, D. Or a particular sequence, because sequences are in order. That's one sequence, but another one might be B, A, C, D, or might be A, C, B, D, right? or might be D, A, C, B, or might be D, C, B, A. All possible ways to arrange this in order. Remember when we put round brackets, we mean what? Sequence, Sequence that means in order. When we put curly brackets, we mean what? Set. Set, out of order. Sets are out of order and do not repeat elements. That's a different name 
the sets that repeat elements, so to speak, and are called sets. They call something else. Don't bother with them because we don't study them. Sets out of order, sequences in order. So to be clear, this set here is the same as set B, C, D, A, but the sequences are different because the order is different. <clears throat> How many possibilities for sequences do I have? or permutations. Same name. Permutations or sequence is the same. Isn't the factorial? Right. But why is that? So somebody proposed then how many it's n factorial, where in my case here n is what? Four. So that would be four factorial. By the way, everybody knows what factorial stands for? What is factorial? is 1 times 2 times 3 times n. I think it's more useful to think of it as n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times 2 times 1. Same thing, but just think about from the big numbers to the small ones. Why is that? Why the number of sequences? It's always n factorial. Somebody else. I'm tired of you guys. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, somebody who didn't speak yet. Yes? You have a set size n, and for your first choice, you have n options. For your second choice, you have n minus 1 options, because you're already used one. For your third choice, you're already used two, so you have n minus 2 options, and so on. That's the same reasoning like in here. I have five options for the first digit. But whatever I put in restricts the options for the next digit. It's still independent. Every one of those fives will go with every one of those fours. That's true. But they're not five options anymore because the digit I put in is not available. The same thing happens here. You can choose initially as the first symbol in the sequence any one of those n, a, b, c, d. In my case, that will be four choices because I have four elements. But now as I choose one, Whichever one I choose here, say I choose the B, B is not available anymore. I can choose any one of the other three options. So that would be a three. Then once I have B and C, or any pair chosen, the number of options here is only two because those are not allowed. <laughs> Sequences cannot repeat elements. They still have to do only A, B, C, D. So then I have only two options here because now I choose out of A and D, and once I chose a B, a C, and an A, or any particular triplet, I only have one option <coughs> left, which is the last element not chosen yet. So this is useful to think of this factorial starting from the big number, because the way we think of those number of possibilities, initially there's n of them, then n minus 1, then n minus 2, so on and so forth. Everybody follow this? Not bad, right? Hands up. How many people have seen permutations before this class today? OK, so a good number. Uh, if I have, of course, that's four factorial, but if I have a set of uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, that is seven, <coughs> how many permutations are there? One. You can't say it. What? No, no, but if I take these elements and permute them, create oh. permutations, whether you start with a set or a sequence, mean the same thing. Rearrange this in all possible ways. So P7 is 7 factorial. We're going to call this number of how many? That's P n. How many ways can you permute n things? Like with sets, it doesn't matter what the elements are. If I take seven letters, the seven factorial permutations. If I take seven names, there'll be seven factorial ways to list those names. If I take seven numbers, there are seven factorial sequences of those numbers. If I take seven colors, there's seven factorial ways to arrange the colors. Doesn't matter what the elements are, this would be the same. That's good, permutations. We have another one that's called combinations.
from now on, we're going to reserve this name, combination, specifically for this. So until now, when I ask you guys about <laughs> sets, subsets, you guys say, it's all the combination of three, right? Well, the sequence is all the combination of six. From now on, the word combinations, it's reserved for that, not for subsets, sequences, or other things. You have to restrict yourself to not call these other things combinations. From now on, combination has a very specific designation of what it means. Combinations refer to in how many ways can I choose or pick or select a subset of K out of N? Very important that we are selecting a set. We are not selecting a sequence. This is the same question as asking how many subsets uh, have exactly, exactly K, exactly size. The original set has the size N. So how does this go? I have a set A, B, C, D, and E. That's my original set. N is how much in here? The size of this set is five. And K is, suppose K is two. What is the question asking? How many subsets of size <coughs> 2. Or, equivalently, in how many ways can I pick 2 out of 5? I, I want to emphasize, this is not in order. It's still out of order. The original set is out of order. It's A, B, C, D, E and I want to pick two, which is a subset. How many ways can I do that? How many ways? First of all, what are the subsets that have two elements? A, B, A, C, B, C, sorry, A, let's list them in order, A, D, A, E, then I have B, C, B, D, B, E, C, D, C, E, and uh, D, E, right? I hope I got it right. Did I get it right? Mm -hmm. All the possibilities of selecting two things. Those are sets, not sequences. Sets. How many ways can I do that? Uh, you take the, the length of the set minus one. And then you add that number plus the set minus one again. Plus that. So like, like in this case it'd be four plus three plus two plus four. And then if you had the size of uh, of like three pairs, then you'd have three plus two. So plus let's four. explain his reasoning. That's correct. He's saying if you pick the first element A, you can make four pairs of it. Because it's A plus any one of the others. Now, that's all including A. Now I'm done with A. And I don't have A. I pick B as the first element. And then I have three pairs to make with B, not with A, because A is already done. So that's three pairs. So the four pairs with A are here. The three pairs with B are here. The two pairs with C, but not including A and B are there. And that's the last pair. That's the four plus three plus two plus one. This reasoning, while it's correct in this particular case, does not scale to what if I want to choose six out of nine things. That would be a lot more complicated. So how do we do this? We're going to 
call these things, the answer to this question is going to be written like this. And this read and reads n, choose k. Literally means choose k out of n. That, that's what it says. That's how many ways can I choose 20 students from my class of 110? n will be 110, k will be 20. So let's think a little bit of how to do this in a more general case. Here's an idea. I'm going to list all permutations. So I look at A, B, C, D, E, and I, I say, OK, here's a permutation, B, C, A, E, D. And I list another one, C, D, A, B, E. And I list another one, uh, A, D, C, E, B. And I list another one, D, A, C, B, E, so on and so forth. So step one, list of permutations. Step two, just select the first. Permutations are in order, right? The same permutations, I mean in order, all possible sequences. Select the first k as a set. So if my k is two, I'm going to say, you can list all these permutations. How many permutations are there? And factorial. And then I chop the first two. Say, OK, that's my answer, B and C. I, I, got select, I want to select a set of two, so I take the first two. I do another permutation, C, D, A, B. I chop the first two, the first K, K is two. I list this, I chop the first two, and I chop the first two, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Would that give me all pairs of two possible? Certainly. There are certain permutations that start with A, B, B, C, C, D, so on and so forth. So I get my answer, all the possible choices. The problem is, what's the problem in counting? Did I count everything? Did I get every pair of two or subset of two? Yes. But what's the other question? Did I count anything more than once? Yes. Yes, a lot. Right? I count a lot more than once. For example, AD will appear as AD and as DA right, will appear as AD even when the other stuff is not CEB but CBE. Right? So if I do this, how many times I've counted each that's my plan, but it has more bullets. How many times I count each prefix of k? So I say, that's a prefix. That's the one I need. And this, the remaining part, that's a suffix. That's the part I don't need, because I want to select the first k. How many times everyone that I see B, B, C, E, or C, D, how many times that's counted, I should say for a fixed suffix. That is, I look at all sequences and I say, this part is fixed. So for example, B, E, C. But this part can be A, D, or D, A. So how many times I count each prefix, A, D, on all permutations that have a fixed suffix. N factorial? Not N factorial, because this part is fixed. This part can be arranged in any possible way. What's the length of this k? What's the length of this? N minus k. N minus k. So what I'm asking here is this part is fixed. I fix this part to be C, E, B, for example. How many ways now? A, this A, D is the same answer because I'm looking for a set. This will be the set A and D. But how many times I've counted this for this particular fixed suffix? K factorial. K factorial. This for a fixed suffix, how many A, D, D, A I've seen? 
Well, I've seen every single permutations in A and D for any particular suffix. But even the other way I've counted more for a fix prefix. Like now A D is fixed. How many times got counted with different suffixes? How many times I count AD because it was fixed AD, but I had different BCE, BEC, BC, you know, CBE, and so on and so forth? How many times I've encountered a particular answer like AD because I've got permutation in this set? And minus K, if I do. If I apply my procedure here, list all the permutations, and chop off the number you need, K, in this case, K is 2. Every particular answer has been counted that many times because I've counted all the permutations of the prefix and also times that many times I've counted the suffix, which I don't need to count it more than once. So the answer of this is this is all the permutations I started with, but everybody has been counted k factorials for the suffix. And again, n minus time, n minus k factorial for the suffix. Every once of this times every once of that is the number of times k factorial times n minus k factorial is the number of times I repeated the pair AD. Put it another way. What are all the permutations that gave me that exact answer AD? In how many ways do I get exactly this answer AD? So the answer here is the set AD because I want to choose K out of N. Well, how many times I generated a permutation that will return AD? There are K factorial possibilities in here because you can permute this in any way you want. And there are N minus K factorial possibilities in here because I can permute this any way I want. So this is the total number of permutations that if I chop the first two, the first two will be always AD. Who follow me here? I listed all the permutation, that's N factorial. And then I do a partition by the answer. I partition into the answer in all these permutations here is going to be AD, because I'm taking the first two. <coughs> a separate answer is to create the pair BE versus the rest, ACD. That's a different answer. The answer here will be BE, because I'm chopping the first two. But in how, many, how many permutations will give me this exact answer? I can generate this by permuting BE in any way in the first k spots, that's k factorial. And by permuting ACD in any way I want, that's three positions, so that's n minus k factorial. Right? k is 2, n minus k is 3. Every one of my answers will be generated k factorial times n minus k factorial. So what do I do? I take all my answers that I get, which are n factorial, because I get an answer for every single permutation. Each answer has been generated that many times. So I divide the number of answers by how many times each answer is repeated to get the number of unique answers. So in my case, this here, k factorial times, that's 2 factorial times 3 factorial, right? So the number n choose k, 5 choose 2, is going to be 5 factorial divided by 2 factorial, 3 factorial. Is that correct? Let's do a quick check. How much is 5 factorial? 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5. And this is 1 times 2 times 1 times 2 times 3, right? 1 to 3 goes to 1 to 3. And I'm left with? Left to 10, right? Is that true? 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 is 10. So that is uh, 
combinations. And I want to do one more thing. Let's see if we, if you guys have the answer to that. If I want to choose out of n plus one things, uh, k things, uh, that is the same as choosing from n k things, choosing from n uh, k minus one things. This has to do with the partition idea. If I want to count how many times I can choose k students out of n plus one, I can think about it in either choosing the first student, A, and then I have to choose the rest of K minus one students from the remaining students, or not choose the student A, and then have to choose all students out of the remaining N students. So suppose I pick a student here, I pick him, and I say I want to choose 20 students out of 110. This is 110, and this is 20. And I partition my space into two counts. All the possibilities, including him, that means I have to choose the rest of the students out of everybody except him, right? Because he, he's in the set already, so I have to choose the rest of 19 out of the rest of 109. And separately, the other partition is to say, okay, not include him. Those are partitions because they're mutually exclusive. Any choice would be either with him or without him. So now if I don't choose him, I get to choose all 20 students out of the rest of 109 students. So this is a partition encounter. That's where we're going to start Tuesday. No. <laughs> 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 